Hello, my name is Chris Rader, and I'm a product director at CenterCode. I specialize in uh, beta testing, uh, but I have background in product analytics, user research, uh, and obviously I've been in product management for um, around five, six years now. Prior to CenterCode, I worked at a company called Western Digital. Um, I handled user research there uh, for most of the consumer products and some of the business products. So that gave me a, a fair expertise of working with product managers, working with product development, engineers, and QA, and, and user experience teams. If you do have any follow-up questions, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can go ahead and shoot me an email. I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. I'm excited to be doing this webinar for Product School. The uh, focus of this webinar is about how to take your product from uh, something that's good or average to something that's really great, something that users enjoy, something that really stands out in your market. I work with a lot of companies that are, are going through, um, say, a beta phase building their products, so I get to deal with product managers. I get to see where their product is, is at in early stages and be able to look at products and, and see how we can make them better. Really quick, I just wanted to give you a, a background on Center Code. Um, this is the company I've worked with for uh, almost six years. Um, they focus on continuous customer-driven product improvement. That's the idea of uh, improving your products using what we call alpha, beta, and delta testing. This allows you to bring your market into your product development process, help you shape those products, build those products, and tune them to your uh, customer's preference. At Center Code, we provide a, a SaaS platform. This allows teams that run uh, these alpha, beta, and delta tests. This is also what our services use to, to manage those uh, projects. We have those services where we have a fully dedicated person that actually manages a full project for you uh, and your, your programs. We have a global network of testers that's over 250,000 people across the world that we recruit for testing. And of course, we have this, uh, this framework, this uh, way of doing the testing itself. And we provide a certification to teach teams how to, um, how to run the programs. You'll see a nice list here of people that we work with. Some of the biggest names in tech um, are our customers. Here's a, a brief story about how we work with Autodesk. Uh, more than 90 product managers at Autodesk actually use the center code software to validate their designs, to put their product in front of customers uh, before it launches, before it reaches the rest of their customers. Uh, Roku has been leveraging our services for uh, years, since uh, some of their very first products. We typically tend to partner with those high growth technology companies and those modern enterprises. Now for this webinar, I kind of want to go through just a sequence, a sequence of events. These are essentially leading to the, the challenge that a lot of product managers are facing, and then methods and things that we, uh, we as product managers will, will do in order to um, move our product from that average product to something that's, that's great. So throughout this webinar, we're going to cover um, capturing product KPIs, uh, prioritizing um, things that we need to improve on our product, uh, and learning about things people uh, like or things that are delighting our users. How will my product or say an update to a product be received by my market? Now, I know this is a lot of what keeps us up. We want to know whether or not we're going to be successful, if this new release has the right features, if this new product is going to, say, beat out the competition. Um, will people be happy or satisfied with my product? So how is acceptance measured? How are we judging whether or not our product meets the expectations of our users? So a lot of times we'll look at things like the usage or product analytics. This can give us things like whether who's downloaded. It can give us our monthly active users. It could see whether or not that new feature that we're implementing is being used. Um, it can see how long people are, are, are using each of these features or you know, how many errors I'm running into or, or how stable my uh, builds are. Customer satisfaction is definitely one of those things that we're using to measure the acceptance. This is the perception or attitudes that the customers are leaving about the product. So typically we'll see things like the NPS or Net Promoter Score um, for those consumer facing products that sell on say Amazon. You'll see things like the star ratings. We'll also have some kind of ratings on say G2 Crowd or anything that's using to rate our software. 
Of course, we have uh, our support volume. This has given us a good idea of whether or not our products are um, broken or um, if, if there's something that's wrong. We want to look at those things like, um, say, call drivers. Um, but we, we want to look at our support volume to see whether or not we're, we're hitting our mark or whether or not people are calling in to get more information or of course, we keep our eye on the product churn or returns. We want to make sure that people are satisfied with the product and they're keeping the product. Uh, so for you software folks out there, it's whether or not customers continue to use the product or they stop using the product. Um, we want to look at whether or not they want to refund the product or whether or not to resubscribe. And then we have obviously the, the, the mother of all acceptance criteria is whether or not I'm hitting my um, revenue or my sales goals. Now, these are all um, sometimes metrics that we're looking at or, uh, you know, categories of metrics that we're looking at to understand whether or not our product is accepted by our market. And of course, these are common ones. They're not necessarily the full list of things that we're using to judge acceptance. These are just some of the most common ones. Now, in a, in a world of product development, um, I've in my past dealt with a lot of product managers, um, some that aren't willing necessarily to live, listen to the data and uh, are more willing to uh, take the leap themselves. Uh, and this concept of uh, let's wait and kind of see, let's see what's going to happen after release rather than going with the data that I have here. Um, this is the uh, predicament that a lot of product managers or people providing data for product managers are sitting in is that, you know, how much of this data can I trust? How much is accurate? Um, but for a lot of product managers, we should have a way to be able to predict how successful we're going to be. So can we predict the product success? Can we, can we look at our product in a state inside development and see whether or not we're going to be successful before we get reach our market? So we're going to hop into our second section, which is about capturing product KPIs. So we talked a little bit about um, the ways that we measure acceptance. These are the things that we can capture in, say, um, in development uh, to give us an idea of how well our product is, is performing. So here we have um, essentially which is just quarters sitting at the bottom. So this looks like it's a two year span um, and modern uh, modern product de uh, delivery model. So this is the idea of building a product over a period of time. So we take these different phases. So we're in development. Obviously, most of us are working in some kind of agile framework, but we're continuously developing. We're, we're, we're getting QA involved. We're testing. We maybe have some user research going on. But the uh, just before we launch the product, we're likely going through these two different phases. It's that alpha and beta phase. It's when the product is almost ready to release, and we have all these moving pieces ready to go. And we want to get a, a, a test. We want to we want to throw these into real users' environments and get a sense of how this product is working. So after we launch, we have all these iterative releases where we're looking at, you know, adding some new features, getting some more improvements, getting some more, uh, some stabilization uh, software improvements in there. So you can see, ideally, we have these two alpha, the alpha and beta phase that we're, we have a chance to see how well the product is working as all components are added together, as it's essentially a release candidate for our product. So during that time, and from what we've seen, um, it's in a code in our in our industry and what I've experienced myself is that here's the three most common ways of getting a sense of how well your product is performing during those tests. We have essentially our net promoter score and star ratings, which are things that we typically capture, say, at the end of the project, uh, say a beta test or, or an alpha test, and we're looking for how, how are users are receiving this product? How, how do they how, what is their sentiment towards it? So for Net Promoter Score, we're taking that likeliness to recommend, and we have a scale of basically a negative 100 to 100, um, and anywhere in that range, we could get something, for example, there is a 30, and that would tell us what our Net Promoter Score is. Um, the calculation is based on um, promoters and detractors, so it's taking the difference between those and giving you a score. Star rating, obviously closely related to the uh, Amazon star rating, but it's essentially just that mock review of the product. So it's a scale from one to five, basically how satisfied or dissatisfied are you with the product? And you typically see this in a form of an average, uh, and uh, most of the time we'll have some kind of decimal uh, associated with it as well. Like in this case, a 4.2 out of a five point rating scale. And the last one is essentially a, it's not necessarily um, a score, uh, but it's uh, your issues that were identified on your project. And it's giving you a count of, of the issues that were received during testing, which of those things uh, or what counts are we looking at by severity? How, how important are these things that I need to pay attention to? 
So now obviously we want to use those, those three metrics that we just looked at to get an idea of how well our product is performing. But we always have this, this influence on the accuracy of the data. So I have a lot of product managers that will come up and they'll ask, you know, I want to predict, you know, what my NPS score, what my star rating is going to be. Um, a lot of time NPS scores and star rating are the most common metrics that uh, product managers will use to dictate or to judge their success outside of revenue and sales, obviously. Um, but this idea of NPS being more holistic than something that typically happens on the beta test, um, when your product is launched and you're capturing something like a net promoter score or a star rating, it's including a few things that we're not testing necessarily in an alpha and beta test. A lot of times you have things like a marketing experience or a sales experience or the support experience. A lot of times a customer will have to go through purchasing of a product um, or getting support on a product. A lot of times that's not tested. So those things are not influencing our, our beta scores. Another thing influencing the accuracy is uh, whether or not you're providing the product for free or product subscription for free, or if they're paying for it. A lot of times this is gonna end up biasing, um, usually positively, um, their, the users as they are rating the product. Things like your product state. A lot of times uh, there is some um, cushion between your, your beta test and what's going to be released. Uh, obviously, we want to address anything that's going to impact our scores, but then that puts into question how accurate is the information, something like an NPS or star rating, if I'm going to fix some of the things that I ran into in one of these early tests. So we always typically re recommend um, when you are running these tests, run um, multiple projects in order to find that uh, find the issues early, fix those, and then eventually you get to the point where your beta test is essentially your release candidate, allowing you to get a, a, a more accurate number. And then of course your target market, who you who should be purchasing the product. Um, when we talk about recruiting for a beta test, uh, most of the time, if it's not your actual customers. Um, you're, you're making uh, estimates of who should be buy, buying this product based on you know customer needs. But a lot of times in a, in a beta test, you're recruiting based on those characteristics, but they're not always the, the, typically the people that end up buying the product. It's just, you know, we're trying to uh, personify what, what our target market looks like. So we try to recruit for those people. So these are all the things that could potentially impact the accuracy of those net promoter scores or star ratings uh, in a beta test. And remember, our goal is to identify metrics that which we could predict the success of our product during development rather than after development. So I hope that advice helps. The idea of capturing those product KPIs during your beta test, making sure you, you, you do your best to uh, get that information as accurate as possible by recruiting the right target markets, um, by uh, cleaning some of your issues or fixing those issues before you get to essentially what you'd like to treat as your, your product KPI uh, version of a beta where, where you're just trying to see um, those uh, ratings beforehand. Uh, of course, you can capture things like you know usage analytics and whatnot uh, during those beta tests. So that should also help you um, in, in solving that problem of uh, how well is this product going to be received. Next, I want to talk a little about um, prioritizing um, what we consider these fix and improvements uh, during this uh, pre-launch phase. So ideally, we, we would be able to address some things uh, beforehand and hopefully early as possible uh, because we can't make uh, many changes right before we launch. Uh, we don't want to push back those, those dates unless we absolutely have to. So we don't like to delay those product launches. Um, sometimes that first-to-market strategy um, is, is extremely good for us, um, but we also don't want to launch with something that's going to really impact our uh, our brand or negatively affect our, our, our brand image. So let's get into uh, prioritizing these fixes and improvements early on. So I get asked this question pretty often amongst uh, product managers, but can I make a difference in in essentially what's the last, you know, uh, last few minutes of, of development? So in order to do this, we need to take a look at what we have uh, to to work with. So if we have that net promoter score and that star rating, that are those those product KPIs that we're capturing, and we have a list of issues and ideas, things that people have been submitting to us uh, along the way in those alpha and beta tests. Now you can kind of see that the the list of issues and ideas are obviously impacting or affecting that net promoter score and star rating. It's essentially the qualitative data. The net promoter score and star rating is a number. It's it's giving me how many people feel a certain way about the product. So I have you know, um, you know the average ratings, 
And then the list of issues and ideas are the things that are, are, are driving those scores. So I have issues that are typically, you know, detracting my scores, and then I have some ideas that are going to do that. Uh, basically, things missed or features that that are missing from the from the product. But what I want to do with that list is I want to see what's actually driving my score. So I want to take a list of what's important to me as a product manager, what's important to my users, and then I want to see um, how popular those things are. So for example, what issues are receiving a lot of attention? What are the things that are going to cause um, support calls to go up or tickets to come through um, or returns? Um, so we, we take this idea of what's important and what's popular to identify what's going to be impactful in my product. Uh, this is essentially a way of prioritizing that list of issues and ideas in terms of uh, these two components. Now at Center Code, uh, when we when we run our, our beta projects and we, we, we evaluate these products, um, we take these and we turn them to numbers that helps us uh, prioritize based on a figure. So we have at center code um, this idea of maximizing your test results. So you can see in the top left corner, the top left box, we have recommendations. So these are the things that are the top things that we need to fix. That's not all the issues. It's only 18% of them. So that 12 is only 18% of the total number of issues that I have. But it actually equates to 76% of the impacts so of those 12 issues. They're the most impactful, meaning they're the most important and most popular. So that way I'm maximizing the attention I have or the efforts that I put in development by hitting those things that actually are meaningful or like we say, impactful. So as you get closer to the end of your launch, you wanna make sure you're focusing on the things that are impactful, not necessarily the huge list. If you have you know, 100 issues that you're looking at, uh, you don't have to fix all of them. Uh, the, the truth is you don't have time to fix them all <laughs> unless you're going to stop your, your release. Uh, and even then you're, you're probably still gonna be chasing you know, um, issues the, the whole time throughout development. So this concept of really identifying the things that are going to drive your score up and making sure you reduce the things that are driving your score down. So I know it wasn't a very long section, um, but the, the concept of prioritizing based on those KPIs, you want to look at what's causing those scores to go up. But the idea is that you can get a judge of how successful you're going to be by what things are driving those scores up and down. And it gives you something actionable. You can taste that, take that list of, of what I need to fix or what I need to improve in my product, and you can uh, change them before release uh, if you want your score to go up. Then again, we're talking about this concept of taking something average to something good or great. So next we go into this section that's really learning about what's what's working well. We, we say delighters, we, we wanna identify what things are working well in my product. So did the users, the customers like what I built? So I, I've heard this saying a lot, um, but the concept in the past was, you know, if they didn't say anything about the product, they didn't submit an issue, they had no ideas on it, that it was good news. The the users liked the feature, um, or that you know thought onboarding was simple. If they didn't, if they strictly didn't say anything about it, so this concept has been challenged uh, as of recent. Um, you know, at Center Code, obviously, we see a lot of products go through our, our our processes, but this concept of we can collect whether or not things are working. We can we can collect that good news. Uh, we don't have to take you know silence as as a sign that something's working well. So you know, pushing this out there for everyone as they push their products through those alpha and beta phases of uh, of testing, try to collect things that uh, are considered you know praise. What what people like, what's working with the product, or what do they enjoy? This gives you a sense of how well you met those expectations, or how well those features are working. Or say you designed a new onboarding experience, how is it being received? Is it simple? Is it intuitive? We don't have to wait for no news. Let's ask for what's working well. And this gives you an idea of, you know, uh, a list of things, of, of positives, things you can go to engineering with and say, hey, you did a great job. Things you can go to marketing with or sales with to give, an, uh, to give them an idea of what's working well. So being in the space where we help product managers build their products, um, we want to share where we, we typically see praise being used. A lot of times um, people will use praise in the questions and answers. So for example, you'll see questions and answers on Amazon and it's um, what features they liked uh, or what they're, how they're using the product specifically. Um, so they can get ahead of some of those question and answers by things that people were enjoying um, rather than a list of things that aren't working.
We see teams use uh, user-generated content or testimonials about what features they like or how they're using products. It's a great way to get content out there, um, and it's uh, early on, so you can kind of you can have a quicker start to your your marketing strategy by having this information. Um, you can use the praise as a marketing confirmation about your current strategy. Uh, you can see what users are liking, what they're saying about it, and you can use it to say you know whether I'm on base or, or off base uh, on our current strategy. Uh, one thing that I love to see is customer stories. Um, when you use praise to um, to tell the story of how a user was using the product and what they specifically liked, it's more relatable. Um, you let the user basically speak for the product and saying this is how uh, this is what they liked about it specifically. Using those customer stories can be extremely helpful in sales calls or sales meetings when you're talking to prospects. Uh, but those stories really help you understand uh, what's beneficial for the customer. So we wanted to recap everything we learned here. Um, using that beta test to capture those product KPIs before launch, give us some um, some confidence in what we're actually going to be launching with. Give us, you know, uh, basically a temperature of where we're at. Using impactful issues and ideas to judge what things we can fix or address before we go to launch, and how we can leverage uh, praise. How we can use what people like in terms of uh, of the product experience and, and how I can uh, leverage that to get more customers or tell better stories um, and, and reach my revenue goals. Uh, so one thing I kind of want to end with was this, uh, in the concept of going from an average to above average is, is some data um, that we have have collected in um, a lot of projects that we ran in, in 2020 uh, for product development. So uh, this is probably going to look complicated to a lot of people, but we have two charts here. The left one is NPS, or Net Promoter Score, and the right one is Star Rating. And what we're looking at is the percentile rank of Net Promoter Scores and Star Ratings. Um, and really, what I want you to focus on here is these gray areas, the gray bars uh, in between these two uh, charts here. Um, and you can see the text here is indicating that this gray area is where 50% of projects um, are. So if you're getting an NPS score between this negative three to 50, you're sitting at with uh, basically average. This is where most people are at. And on the uh, star rating side, between that 3.8 to 4.5, your product is average. Um, so looking at this really gives us a good idea of how we can leverage those uh, those improvements that we've identified those those things that we're prioritizing to say okay if i were to adjust these things or implement these things or improve these things um, could i make my product great could i beat out some of these other products can i be better than my competitor so we don't typically show a lot of this information, but here's these are these are great metrics to look at. Uh, you can grab a, a screenshot and use it for your next beta test or um, your next test that you're running um, to get an idea of where you stack up against the the rest of the industry. So I want to say thank you guys for the opportunity uh, to listen to me to let me uh, go through my my presentation. Uh, of course, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to answer any any questions or just you know chat about a. Uh, you know, some experience that I have with, with product management. Um, and I look forward to doing this again in the future. Um, I appreciate all of your time. Uh, thank you.